C'est l'enregistrement. Bonjour à tous et à toutes. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the first workshop organized by Climate Chance, the observatory, worldwide observatory. So it's the first one this week. We're going to present the report that we published this Monday. I'm waiting to see if everyone came in. So my name is Antoine Gelo. I'm the coordinator of the Observatory for Climate Change and with Samuel and Tanya and Marine. We are the co-authors of the sectorial uh, report that was published this Monday. So we're going to present to you uh, this uh, uh, in uh, summarized form this uh, right now. And then we're going to look at some things, uh, go over some topics with our uh, participants. So which tools will be able to speed up the decarbonization of the electric electricity mix and the electrification of users. So for logistical questions, <clears throat> let's remember that this webinar is uh, recorded it's there is also French English uh, interpretation. You can use it at the little button at the bottom of your screen. So you can choose the uh, language that you prefer. It should go for about uh, 90 minutes. And I'm going to give the floor right away to Mr. Laval, who is a researcher and in charge of research at the at Climate Chance. He'll uh, give you a presentation of what we're doing and also of the report that was published this Monday. Bonjour, merci beaucoup, Antoine. Hello, good morning. Thank you, Antoine. Can everyone see every, my uh, screen? Yeah. It seems as if it has been correctly shared. So great. So this workshop is about moving forward with decarbonization of the electricity mix and the electrification of the uses. So I'm going to go through this quite quickly. Especially, I'll go through the sector-based report 2021, which has taken on a new form this year. And then I will give the floor to Pascal Chariot. And then I'll come back and speak about the tech takeaways that we will be talking about concerning today's topic. So for those of you who do not know Climate Chance, it's an organization that was uh, put together after 2021 COP. It is uh, bringing together non-state actors to look at climate-related questions. So there are three main activities. So, uh, firstly, a portal for climate action, looking at best practices on the ground information, and especially concerning questions uh, that are taking uh, that we're looking at in Africa, and then an observatory of climate action. And so, and this was report in the sector-based report uh, the day before yesterday. And so, we're looking at uh, the impact of uh, actual positive actions concerning climate change. And then we put together events in which we try to bring together all of these uh, non-state uh, actors. So, we receive our funding from about 10 partner, public and private partners. So this report, the sector-based report, really looked at what's being done. Whereas sometimes we, we some people tend to concentrate too much on pledges and com, um, commitments. We're looking at what's actually doing. We look, we go beyond the numbers and look at the greenhouse ga, uh, greenhouse gases and looking at and we look at really expert publications and what's really being done. So we do this in a holistic way, and we look at how local authorities, civil society, and companies are actually working for. Um, uh, climate change in 2020, 2021. And we're looking at six six main uh, sectors, energy, transport, building, industry, waste, and land use. So this year, it's the fourth edition, which was the global report in our sec uh, uh, sector-based report. We've uh, changed things up a bit. There are many different uh, uh, chapters and we, this is the backbone of the report. So I'm going to look at this quickly. 
so you can have an idea what you'll find in the report. So it's divided up into six sectors. At the beginning of each sector, you can see the double page that you see here, where we can find the indicators. About 100 indicators. They can give you an idea of what's being done, evolution concerning climate. It's coming from more than 80 sources. This just tells you what that the upcoming topic will be talking about. And then we look at the trends which allows us to uh, analyze what's being done in each sector concerning emissions. So for as an example, we'll look at the subsector of uh, road transportation. And then it is div uh, divided up into two substructures. Then we do a firstly a data overview, which gives a, a holistic overview of the, ev the recent evolution in the sub subsector. And then an observatory lens which allows you to really focus on local questions, local actions, and the, what the actors are doing, of what they've been doing this over this past year in the subsector. And then we have the 50 signals, which are uh, events, initiatives, uh, uh, market ch changes, which could not be qualified as trends today, but are somehow the antechamber of uh, what's going to be tomorrow's trends. So it's going to be something that we're going to keep uh, an eye on over the near future. And then we finish up with uh, case studies. We do these with various organization partners. And we look at uh, initiatives, best practices, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So 16 countries were looked at coming from around the world. And then also we had a summary of the report in 10 main transversal takeaways. You can find this in the uh, decision maker roundup in on in, uh, on our web page. So for example, we look at decarbonation of uh, the electricity mix and the electrification of users. So I'm going to give the floor back to uh, Mr. Uh, Antoine. Thank you very much. So if you haven't yet had the time to read it, have a look go through it, really target uh, what you're going to look for. And we've also made it more interactive, which allows you to really choose the topics that, uh, that you're interested in. So Pascal Cheriot, thank you for being here. You're the chair of Enodata. It's a research and um, a research and uh, consulting company that's been uh, working for the past 30 years, working in globalization of energy uh, on a global scale. Every year you put together a report concerning the uh, various energy uh, topics. This year was concerning COVID's impact and the structural changes that have been changed, which will change over the future following the pandemic. <clears throat> So you've been able to look at the evolution of the greenhouse gas emissions and so that we can, which helps us to uh, orient and change our uh, uh, actions concerning public policy. So nowadays, <coughs> electrification is really the main leverage for transition in certain sectors, transportation, heating, building heating, international mobility, all of these things. Everyone is talking, rightfully so or not, concerning progresses of, of electrification. <clears throat> all of this is going on uh, with the various public and private uh, stakeholders. This leads to uh, efficiency. <sighs> so is moving forward with the low carbon energy mix uh, in the electricity sector, is it really able to uh, keep up with the uh, growing needs of electrification? C'est pas de ma faute. C'est parfait. C'est bon? <laughs> Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Donc, je continue en français si j'ai bien compris. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. So I'd like to show, share with you a few slides. So we can look at the challenges and the trends concerning electrification and decarbonization of the electricity mix, because of course, 
we're speaking a lot about it. It's a, a hot topic in the future concerning the one of the leverages of the decarbonization of the society. So here you can see the Kaya equation. I'm not sure if you, uh, if you know about it. It's concerning CO2, and it's the multiplication of various uh, factors within the population, uh, the wealth per capita, the energy intensity of the economy, and the level of carbonization of the electricity uh, production. Electricity allows has two main contributions. It leads, but both, both of these factors uh, uh, support the other. It leads to energy efficiency and a decrease in the carbon factor, so decarbonization. <clears throat> so when you look at the both, at both, what is important? When you don't have enough electricity, uh, or, uh, when you have when you use less electricity, efficiency goes up. This is concerned for concerns heating, transportation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So even if electricity is uh, still very carbonated, it's very important that uh, these carbon factors go down. So one of the most important thing is to mitigate the GHG, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So you can see here on the right, you can see the share of electricity in final consumption by regions. So you, and this is up until 2020. So we're only at 20% of uh, final consumption in uh, by electricity. So it's way behind uh, oil and gas. You can see here that in the uh, developed countries, it's a quite a um, slow and regular uh, increase, about 15 to 20, whereas in China, it's very quick, the increase. So electrification, let's keep going. <clears throat> let's look at the challenges. So we look at this from a historical time uh, point of view. So from the time, it's, you can see here, gray 2020, dark gray 2020, and then two new scenarios with, uh, um, in blue is, this corresponds to the old NDCs, and the green is the inner green scenario which is between 1.5 to 2 degrees heating. So the electrification globally go, went up from 20, 15 to 20%. So structurally speaking, it's quite slow. It's not something that is really quick, but we see here that it's really going to speed up uh, in the last 20 years of this projection period. And uh, even, or especially when we look at the energy scenario, so 1.5 to 2%, we see that the electricity uh, demand will go up exponentially. So when you see here, when we reach 40% uh, the share of the electricity in final demand, we're going to actually push this up a bit in the newer uh, scenario. Some say yet more, some say no, some say that it will be about 50%, but this is the all electric uh, solution. <clears throat> but these are debates that are ongoing but the share of electricity is going up. It's going up slowly, but it, one of our big challenge is that it goes up quicker. <clears throat> so we look at sector by sector here. So on the left here is the total. That's what we saw previously. And then here we can see the difference in the share of electricity in, the, in final demand in the final, in the different sectors. So buildings have gone up by 5%, 25 to 30%. <clears throat> this includes residential buildings. And we think that we may even get between 50 to 60% or achieve 50 to 60%. And this will be uh, following various covenant impacts, which will be a large leverage industry. It, today, it's about 20%. There are some industries which will be easily electrified, others no. And then transportation. <clears throat> and we see that the share of electricity is very low. Today is 2%. This is usually public transport, PT, trams, trains, etc. all of these. And, but when we look at the road use, electrification is at less than 1%. So it's a large challenge. And even if we factor in the EVs on large scale, we only uh, achieve, quote unquote, to only achieve 20%. <clears throat> 
So the first challenge, electrification, second one, uh, speeding it up. <clears throat> so we can see here that we're at 20, we're trying to come up to 40%. And we know that the other factors are not only uh, carbonized, there's uh, liquid gas, uh, oil, et cetera, et cetera. But there's also a question concerning biomass and what is the share of green electricity, green electricity and green energy. So it's not the only factor that we have to look up, look at when we look at this um, <clears throat> electricity and energy basket. <clears throat> so how about uh, electricity production? I I intensity is decreasing slowly, maybe even very slowly. Here on the left, you can see the emission factor so the amount of CO2, CO2 that is being produced by or per megawatt hour. And we see that it's going down very, very slowly over 20 years because it's gone down only about 10% over the past uh, 20 years because uh, worldwide uh, electricity use coming from <clears throat> emerging market countries, especially China, uh, Southeast Asia, Vietnam, is going up very quickly. And the, and the, the share, the share of part carboné, notamment du we charbon. know that the developing countries use a lot of um, <clears throat> coal fired electricity generation. You can see here that coal has been going up more than the other fuels. So the uh, trend is the decrease, the decreasing trend is very slow. We can see here the power mix between 20, 2000 and 2020 with the production that has uh, almost doubled, but fossil fuels are still about 60%. Whereas we can see in the details, uh, oil has decreased uh, quite a lot. Gas has increased. We know that gas emits less than oil, and we can see that coal has decreased, decreased a very little bit. <clears throat> so let's look at the factors here that are going down slowly, slowly. This is a, a graph per kilowatt hour. So the amount of CO2 emissions of electricity produced by per kilowatt hour between 20 and 2020. We can look at the future up until 2030. We can look at the two green and blue scenarios as I spoke about, uh, which I spoke about previously. And here in 2050, we can see that we may think there will be a decrease by about uh, uh, 80 to 90 percent. So it would be quite uh, large. So this is what we think here on the right, what will be the um, <clears throat> electricity mix, the energy mix in uh, the future. We think that other uh, renew renewables will increase uh, exp exponentially. A coal will almost be phased out. <clears throat> there will be some fossil fuels used and the different types of bioenergy, which will then be used, of course. And the nuclear uh, energy production will be uh, maintained at a lower level. So to wrap things up, we can look at the various actions which will lead, allow us to speed up electrification and decrease uh, carbonization. There are uh, competitiveness, competitiveness uh, questions. And right now, it's quite good. We also have to look at the carbon price visibility and how much emissions will actually cost so that the efficiency can be achieved. Then we have to look at the R&D aspects, standards, regulations, the, the icons that represent the various sectors that I just spoke about, industry buildings and transportation. So we'll come back to that more in detail uh, in a second or later. All of these will allow us to electri um, electrify the final uses, especially concerning electricity in various countries. And then we can see here how we can speed up decarbonization. Uh, uh, this is usually through policy objectives. We saw that at COP 2021 through various uh, pricing, uh, capturing, uh, exchange, etc. <clears throat> this is what we've spoken about previously. And here is a quite uh, quick summer, uh, uh, summary. So the share of electricity in uh, final consumption has been going up slowly, but has been going up slowly. And the challenge is uh, between 40 to 50% in uh, 2050. We can see here key electrification drivers. We see um, uh, the breakaway uh, topics. <clears throat> 
we can see what is the power mix decarbonization. It's a, a very, very uh, slow, and that's the big uh, challenge in the future, especially to reduce emissions uh, in the future, thanks to electrification. Talked about the electricity mix with a rebound effect, which was described earlier on regarding the electricity uses, gas and electricity help uh, save energy. So if we look at this individually and also collectively, how we can increase or extend the energy demand to other sectors, which did not require it so much before. For example, digital transition, I'm always struck to see how the EU has associated the green transition to the digital transition. There is a stake there to extend this to other domains, other sectors, to electrify other domains and sectors. Is this a risk, a real risk, would you say, that is something that can be observed in coming years that would, in a sense, contradict the evolution of electricity mix, which has difficulty decarbonate, being decarbonated? As you said, yes, there is a risk indeed. There are studies on the rebound effect when you gain in efficiency and, uh, and gains in cost as well, you also get other rebound effects, uh, probably about half of what has been saved, whether it be for households, for economic projects, you spend less. For example, household budgets, the energy part of it is pretty much stable over decades. If there is a decrease, if energy is less costly, the risk in France, but globally, not just in France, people would say, well, let's heat a bit more. Let's use a bit more heating. So in the end, you don't actually save so much. What you might gain on the one hand for heating, for example, for housing, is actually compensated by the number of square meters per person, which keeps uh, expanding the gain of efficiency for cars, incredible gains of, effic of efficiency, but people buy bigger cars and there are less people per car. So in a sense, consumption continues to increase when there are actually gains of efficiency. So on average in France, you have maybe 1.2 people per car, and it used to be 1.6 people per car 30 years ago. So there are gains, but also rebounding effects, more or less direct ones, especially when you take some analysis, you look at the gains without actually also taking into account these other aspects. And we only, seem to focus on the gains, hence the challenge. How do you establish norms for this to stop or, or slow down this rebound effect and that it would be only on the goodwill of the economic stakeholders or citizens? It's a good thing that you mentioned this regarding pub or transport and how things uh, develop over time. We will talk about this with Mahoksma, and we know that this is something that we have dwelt on for some time during the report. Samuel, over to you. Would you maybe uh, take us through these various elements in the report? What have, the, what have been the drivers? We've talked about industry, we've talked about transport, we've talked about building sector. Each of these sectors, each of the sectors have undergone some use changes. What have been the levers uh, from the company's point of view, also citizens' point of view, or local authorities, in order to make these uses? Thank you indeed. I will answer this question and I will share my screen again and I will focus on the key takeaways from our sector-based 
report, which was published on Monday. This report, the title of this is Back to the Future 2021, Great Acceleration of Climate Action and Emissions. Our analysis is that the rebound of, uh, econ of the activities, on the one hand, we see that climate action is um, speeding up with the commitments to carbon neutrality and so on and so forth. And on the other hand, despite, despite these trends, emissions are on the increase again, and the many commitments from the companies, from the business sector are not compatible always with the Paris Agreement. So the report of 2021, we've tried to synthesize this complexity and these contradictions as far as the electrification of uses and decarboni decarbonization of electricity mix, which are struggling. And that's quite representative of this overall teachings or takeaways. Globally speaking, just to show you what I'm talking about here in the next few minutes, the electrification of uses is central to the private and public uh, sectors, stakeholders. No sectors can avoid the transport issues, uh, the automobile sector, buses, uh, an increase of electric buses, electric bicycles, electric railways as well. For example, in India during the pandemic, India took this opportunity of the lockdown and the fact that their network was not used so much to electrify over 6,000 kilometers of railways, also in the maritime sector and aviation sector. I would encourage you to take a look at what we have written on this. So electrification is key to these sectors. Also, I will mention the building electrification. Pascal mentioned this for the buildings. And finally, and I have mentioned this, uh, and I again would invite you to look at the report regarding hydrogen production. That has been a key topic since 2019, 2020. Small parts of hydrogen is produced by electricity or electrolysis to have green hydrogen. But in 2020, this way of producing hydrogen is, is developing, and that's the commitments that we have heard since 2019, 2020, investments which are four times over uh, what it was in 2018. Now a focus on the automobile sector for electric cars and the building sector for the electric car market. This has increased greatly this year. We have called this trend. We've said that this sector does not know the crisis Overall, the electric car market, the car market overall has decreased, but for the electric car market, that's quite the opposite, plus 43% globally. And in Europe, it's actually plus 137% in 2020. As you can see on this graphic, the market share, the sales uh, of electric cars in Europe and pretty much mainly in China, actually, and Europe. Then we've identified several reasons for this increase. Recovery plans, many have given credits for this transition, $147 billion for low carbon mobility as part of the recovery plans after the first lockdowns due to the pandemic. Then many local policies in favor of the uh, soft mobility and electric vehicles. Cities in China have put out subsidies to help buying electric vehicles. Cities in Europe, in Europe as well, which have speeded up 
uh, charging station, the development of charging stations. 231 cities have created uh, low emission areas or zones to encourage electric vehicles, mainly in Europe, out of the 231 cities, the majority are in Europe. Then local governments also are actually are doing the opposite in 28 US states, registration fees for registering uh, ve electric vehicles, the fee are higher than non-electric vehicles. So car manufacturers or car dealers rather cannot sell car electrical electric cars. In Connecticut, for example, there was an EV freedom bill to ban this uh, law, and that was rejected this year. Texas also, that's also part of the 17 states, they want to implement higher taxes on electric vehicles because they do not contribute to taxation for the state. So we see that the role of local governments can go in the right direction or not, but can also be a hindrance to electric vehicles. Second main reason for this rebound, more and more national and local targets for the end of ICE cars, ICE vehicles. You see here on this map, the end of uh, the, the deadline for selling ICE cars. And this is followed by a regulation in Europe. And we have focused on this and we've seen the observer's lens has noticed a trend there from 2021, there is a limit of 90 gram of CO2 per kilometer for new vehicles sold uh, on the European markets. This limit, of course, depends on the size of the vehicles. As you can see on the right hand side, you can see the limit of CO2 that is increasing with the size of the vehicle. Now, vehicle cars can compensate, sales of vehicle, electric vehicles can compensate uh, with a system of bonuses and compensation. So at the end of the day, what we see is that European car manufacturers are really pushing for electric vehicles. On average, uh, European, the emissions of cars sold in Europe have gone down by 108, 122 to 108, and that's thanks to EV sales. Most of the manufacturers, car manufacturers, have set objectives for selling EV cars. For example, Ford, Volvo are aiming at 100% electric by 2030, whereas France and Spain aim at uh, banning ICE cars. We have talked with Pascal about this, some contradictions that we have noted in this trend, the place of SUV vehicles among the great parts of the electric vehicles, you find SUV and sedans, or these are more heavy cars than the average. And SUV cars count for around 42% of the uh, total market of new cars. We know that this is a driver for emission increase. To take it further, I would invite you to take a look at this trend regarding the electric car market in our report. Now, the electrification of uses is also a key strategy for decarbonization of buildings. 
11.7% of the heat consumed by buildings in 2019 was of electric origin compared to 9.6% just 10 years ago. That's according to the RN21 report. Uh, they have counted also 53 cities in over 10 countries that have banned the use of fossil fuels for heating new buildings. This movement is actually very important in California, where 52 cities, that's the figure given by Rent21, and it's probably more than 52 cities, 52 cities in California adopted a measure to ban gas from new buildings, which of course has speeded up the electrification of heating systems. Now we also have a page on this, as a response, on the other hand, you see uh, American states that have uh, banned this banning of gas to new buildings. So on this map, you can see in the blue part, all the states that have decided for such a law to ban uh, the ban of gas. These are states uh, which are connected to fossil energy or those that even have issued these laws and have interest in fossil or fuel companies. So for the moment, what we see is something encouraging, an encouraging trend in California, but the opposite in other states. The electrification of end uses is not very efficient if the electricity mix is still highly carbonated. More than 60% of the electricity mix at a global level comes from fossil energy. China in particular has added another 50 uh, gigawatts of coal capacity in 2020. And studies have shown that in some Chinese regions, uh, electrification Attention à bien fermer vos micros. Um, dans certaines régions en Chine, in some regions in China, moving from moving to electricity heating could actually increase emissions. And even in some regions, as in Europe or in the US, there is a ban of coal, yet fossil energy continues to be used. In the US, for example, 85% of coal-fired power plants are reoriented towards other uses converted to natural gas. So renewable energy represents a great part of the new facilities, yet this is more an accumulation rather than a transition approach. There is still use of fossil energy, 60 gigawatts in 2020. And I think the figure was around 30 gigawatts. So it's more of a, we can talk of an accumulation rather than a transition. There is also a case study regarding Vietnam. Vietnam had a rebound of uh, PV installations uh, due to feed-in tariffs that were taking uh, that were ending at the end of December 2020. Therefore, there was a peak in December of 2020 due to this uh, tarification, special tarification, which shows what it can lead to in terms of the acceleration of the decarbonization. Now to end on this topic, we also looked at this, at the levers at the disposal of the stakeholders in order to accelerate the decarbonization. And, and what we have are the energy attribute certificates in order to certify of the megawatts that have been produced by renewable energy. Yet there were some limits to this, for example, the fact that there is much more offers and demands, and it's difficult to, 
to get good savings from that. They were also double counting. Overall, okay, that's one thing regarding the certificates. The other thing is that we have realized that the market is, is more of a mass market, gross market, where new capacities are added after call to tenders, which means that more citizen-focused approaches have difficulties to find their ways and are even threatened in some countries, as in Germany, for example. So what we have observed is that as an alternative, power purchase agreements are more and more popular. These are contracts between producers and consumers to help large companies or cities to to get their supply, to get supplies in. <laughs> and that's probably close to 10% of renewable energy facilities in 2020. You see the graph here on the left, GAFA are using these tools a lot in order to uh, move to uh, renewable energy. What we have noticed is that it allows on for future facilities. So what it does is that for the producer, it gives the producers a visibility. These contracts can be over 20 or 30 years long. These tools therefore help the deployment of RE by securing supply and sales on the other hand. And indeed, this is part of the logic of this market which we're seeing, these trends which we're seeing. These are mainly for large cities like London or Melbourne. So that's it for me. I give the floor to Antoine. Thank you for so the I'll discussion. So I'll take over now from, uh, I'll give the floor to Mr. Antoine. Thank you very much for this uh, presentation, where it allows us to look at various sectors so that we can understand the vastness of the undertaking. So right now, I'd like to uh, change slowly but surely towards a, a sector which is uh, that we chose today. And this is for the, concerning the profile of today's participants concerning uh, transportation. <clears throat> It's a sector that over the past few years has uh, really gone through a lot of uh, accelerations in its electrifications, especially when we looked at the uh, numbers uh, that are quite low, despite this fact that Pascal uh, spoke to us about this compared to other sectors. So in uh, 2020, we saw that there was uh, EVs are very popular with customers in China and Europe. One out of 10 cars in Europe is an EV. <clears throat> it's quite important. Impressive. It's a slow, but uh, it's accelerating. And we can see that many Latin American cities are ordering e-buses for their PT fleets, whereas um, rather we also saw in India that confinement allowed for a vast electrification project of the railways. <clears throat> We also see that this is very important in uh, international com uh, transportation companies, for example, hydrogen for planes, ammoniac for uh, ships, and or uh, quite simply electrification of these transportation methods. Even daily short trips are more and more uh, sometimes electrified. We can think about the scooters that you can see in large cities, for example, free floating, and also the electrified um, uh, local uh, bike rental schemes. So Marusha Kadama, who is the uh, General Secretary of SLOCAT, SLOCAT is a organization working in international uh, transportation, and one of the partners which was of this organization, which was put together in 2009, Now you've put together very many publications yearly, which look at the evolution of mobility following the Paris Agreement. You also published a second edition of Transport Climate Change Global Status Report, which is a publication that we use a lot in our report because it's very complete. It's very well done. <clears throat> so 
Thank you very much. Your website is very interactive and easy to access. <clears throat> so a quick question. What are the main drivers of the mobility uh, electrification success? <clears throat> so uh, thank you very much. And uh, a big round of applause to, uh, applause to the Climate Chance uh, Group. Your report is super. There is so much information in it. It's not an easy task. And uh, uh, thank you for this new way of doing things in the new form. So now I'm going to talk in English. Um, so to be a little bit uh, more fluid in my expression, but uh, feel free to um, talk in. I think that Samuel uh, was already great in giving us some of the answers of what the hype is there. Let me perhaps go and try to pick some of those. Uh, first, let's not forget about the uh, growing concerns over the past decade on air pollution. We have the World Health Organization telling us that nine out of 10 people are actually living in conditions that exceed healthy air pollution standards. I think that that linked equally with the diesel gate scandal that we lead some years ago, somehow it's at the very backbone, you know, of all these uh, hype around uh, electrification. Uh, Samuel was also very good at reminding us how the regulations, the policies and the targets have been crucial. Let's think about the huge number of national urban mobility plans and sustainable urban mobility plans that we have seen particularly in Europe and luckily over the past five years or so we are also seeing how in Latin America and in Africa these policy frameworks are being expanded with some of them containing indeed low emission zones that are linking part of the targets to the electrification. I think that in the past two years we have also seen an incredible and somehow not foreseeable a number of jurisdictions, whether it is at the national level or at the subnational level, setting targets for phasing out internal combustion engines, isn't it? And Samuel, you were talking as well about subsidies, and I think that it's a combination of public subsidies and investment by the private sector that has a, perhaps resulted into two key aspects uh, behind these a hype on electrification. On the one hand, we have seen the prices for batteries really plummeting. But plummeting, I'm, I'm talking here about a, a drop of 88% uh, over the past day decade. And um, we have also seen that the total cost of ownership uh, behind an electric vehicle is getting very competitive. And we are already talking about getting close to parity, you know, in just a couple of, day, uh, of years in some of these eight vehicles. And well, I mean, generally when something's cheaper and feels socially guilt-free, eh, you know, people tend to consume more about it. Um, and I think that my last point on, on, on why could be, uh, well, um, automakers are, are seeing the opportunity behind the green economy and I are seeing the market. This is, this is perhaps a reflection about how good marketing influences behavior, isn't it? And how at the end of the day, the car, owing a car is still a very heavy uh, social status symbol. So I think that we cannot deny that electrification is transforming the life of billions of people around the world already, you know? Uh, there were uh, figures shared by Samuel about how we've reached a, uh, an important mark, you know, 10 million uh, uh, vehicles in 2020. It's also important to see that 25% of all motorized two-wheelers worldwide are electric. And we know that two-wheelers are significant in the global north, but also in the global south. I think it's also important, however, to note that all these zero emission fleets do not compensate the famous SUVs that were mentioned by Pascal. Thanks for that mention, in the sense that we know very much that SUVs continue, continue being the biggest driver of CO2 emissions in, in, in transport. And actually, more importantly, over the past decade, SUVs have been the second largest source of new CO2 emissions globally after the power industry. That is massive. That is really a reflection for all of us of how our uh, behavior is being influenced. So. That revolution of electrification, I think it's technically viable. We are seeing it. It's unstoppable somehow, isn't it? It can be positive if it's really linked to a just transition conversation. Environmentally speaking, it's, it's needed, but we must rebalance the electrification debate if we are really serious about putting it at the service of a comprehensive approach to sustainable uh, low carbon transport that actually addresses the massive challenges on both equitable access to mobility and decarbonization that the transport sector is, is facing. I'm going to stop here perhaps with this first question, if, 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 you, if I may, Antoine. I could continue on this idea of how to rebalance the electrification debate, but perhaps I can do it afterwards. Thanks. 
Merci, Maroussa. Et je vais reprendre moi en français, même si so, je suis pas I'm switching back to French, so it's always easier to do that. You mentioned the SUV. Of course, that's a huge debate for transport. I think you said it. The the IEA uh, said that the SUV are the second reason for uh, gas emissions, which of course is huge. We know that SUV is a range of vehicles which is the more profitable for car makers in terms of raw materials, uh, time spent on making those cars, etc. That's more profitable for them. And as we've seen in our studies, the SUV occupy a large part in the uh, electric car market. We were used to seeing a car market around smaller cars like Zoe and, and other smaller cars. But today, what we're seeing is that we could imagine a larger uh, a market rather that would be dominated by SUVs, pickup cars. We've seen even Joe Biden's driving this electric Ford car, huge car. That's quite extraordinary. Of course, a EV car is much heavier, but there's a choice from car manufacturers to orientate the clients and consumers to this kind of market. Is there a trend there? There is a rebound effect, which we've talked about, that should lead us to question other ways of moving to electricity mode or simply reducing the uh, demand this is a very specific question and a very good question indeed. And I think it's because a, we need to make sure that a, we understand sustainable mobility, not as just moving people or goods from A to B, is very much about guaranteeing that affordable access to transport. So, you know, uh, at the end of the day, uh, a traffic jam of electric vehicles is going to continue being a traffic jam and it's going to have impact on uh, productivity loss. Uh, a transport system that will rely on people being able to afford a private car will be a transport system that will be still perseverating on exclusion, inequality, and that will not work for decarbonization as a whole. So I think that in my opinion, there are, if you want, five fundamental messages about how to rebalance this electrification debate and, and do exactly what you were uh, saying here, uh, Antoine. I think that the first fundamental message is that we really need to put electrification at the service of this wider sustainable low carbon mobility, thinking a lot about integrated modal systems. But we need to do it with integrated policies and public investments that have, are based on what we call in the transport sector, avoid, shift and improve strategies. And we should do it in that order. So first, we should really emphasize approaches that avoid unnecessary motorized trips. We really need to decouple um, um, economic growth from motorization rates, which is something we are inheriting uh, from the last century. That will require better integration between transport planning and spatial planning. For instance, proximity-based planning, that notion of, for instance, the 15-minute city. And um, once we have worked on avoiding unnecessary motorized trips, while of course securing access to mobility, we can focus on catalyzing measures that would help shift transport demand to less carbon intensive modes. And then we can look into approaches that improve the fuel efficiency and the vehicle design. So in order to do those two elements of shifting and improving, we really need to maximize the potential for integrated multimodal transport systems. Let's not make the mistake of thinking that electric mobility is just cars. There's e-tracks, there's e-buses, there's e-bikes, there's e-cargo bikes, and there's the traditionally electrified modes like trams and railways, isn't it? So what we really need to, to do here is to scale up the efforts on the electrification of public transport systems and the electrification of bikes so we can have less private car dependent lifestyles and we can really focus on that notion of accessibility. If you want a second fundamental message to me is that the efforts of electrification must be really put at the service of freight transport. We know that the percentage of emissions generated by moving goods around the globe, it's, it's huge. And actually even in urban environments, 40% of the urban emissions can be on freight, you know, on the way things are delivered to our houses or to the different places where we go buying those things. And so it's very important that we really look into um, uh, uh, combining electrification for rail and road, particularly until we can see um, sustainable solutions in aviation and shipping at scale. 
uh, we really need to boost the electrification of medium and heavy duty vehicles. And we need again to look into urban and spatial planning that is not built just for the car, but that actually allows to use e-cargo bikes, e-minivans to decarbonize the last delivery, the last mile delivery as we call it. If you want a third fundamental message to me is that transport electrification has to be based on clean renewables. And I think that I, I, Pascal rested the case so, so greatly. You know, I mean, the transport sector is still 97% dependent on fossil fuels. We need clear signals to, to the phasing out of subsidies to, to um, fossil fuels in the transport sector. And we need to interrogate value for money in the electrification investments. Perhaps with a triple X, it's like, what are the electrification investments in the transport sector? That are going to generate better access to mobility and transport options for everyone that are going to generate jobs and that are going to help decarbonize entirely you know our fourth fundamental message for me is that we really need to um, revisit institutional legal and financial frameworks to enable that coordination and collaboration across different levels of government isn't it at the national and at the subnational level and that we really need to 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 enhance the coordination with the private sector and the last message that i really need to express and you know, I might not have the time to develop it as fully as I would like to, but say to rebalance the electrification debate, we must really open the lens to a proper global south lens. Right now, the electrification debate is very much a global, uh, a global north uh, oriented debate. And when you put it into the context of a global south lens, uh, you got to first realize that one size doesn't fit all. Electrification in Montreal or in Kiribati or in Nairobi is not the same thing. So cost effective, locally adapted solutions. But then when you go into a, into a global south lens for electrification, you're going to be looking into aspects like paratransit, like a rocketing private motorization rates and the use of two wheelers in the face of limited public transport systems. You're going to be looking into access to energy, access to the grid, into financing those operations of informal transport, into the impact of secondhand uh, uh, vehicle exports from the global north, into extraction of minerals and battery recycling. All these kinds of debates are essential if we are really going to rebalance the electrification debate from a global south perspective. So again, we I know I could be talking for hours and, and, and I know this is this is a debate and more speakers are coming, but these are some of the key elements that I think we can start thinking about if we want to use electrification for the good um, uh, hop on that revolution, which can be very positive, but use it for a wider approach to sustainable low carbon transport. Thanks. Merci Baruxa et merci d'avoir évoqué évidemment le Thank you for talking about the south. Charlene will speak about uh, that in the next few minutes and she'll talk about the situation in Africa. We'll be able to come back to that. So thank you for having uh, explained that. That is a nice segue. <clears throat> to go towards Mr. Colin Norden, who's in Oxford and uh, Bristol University in the UK. So Colin, I'll speak in um, English or in French. I hope you'll be able to hear the uh, question in English. Yes. So you are part of the Institute for Environmental Change, this a research center concerning uh, uh, energy demand in Oxford. You also work at Bristol University and one of your favorite topics we saw it at the COPE, but we also were able to speak about it in governance in uh, electric, electricity or energy systems, especially concerning um, markets and also what governments are actually doing. So we spoke about mobility, electrification and on a worldwide level with uh, Marusha and Samuel, but I would like to ask you from your perspective as a researcher in the UK, but you're looking at European context also. So what are the leverages that these non-state actors have, uh, not only local governments, but also companies to really guide this uh, demand? We see that there is a recovery and that electrification is relaunching and because we have an increase in consumption. So the need is going up. So we have to better manage this demand for especially in transportation. So how can we do this at the local level? How can we uh, look after these leverages at the local level? So um, thank you very, very much. Um, merci beaucoup. Um, I speak in English. <laughs> um, I have prepared a presentation. So I'm just going to start it. Um, hopefully it will work. 
Um, and um, please let me know, does this work? Thumbs up? Excellent. Right, um, so um, can you see uh, wait, display settings? Um, so presenter show. Is this, can you see it now? Does this have the full screen? Excellent. So um, I need to go right to the beginning. Oh, sorry. <laughs> There's a glitch here. I need to go right to the start. Um, yes, so um, I would like to speak about um, the um, uh, subnational perspective. Um, first of all, I want to make sure I have the right screen to start with. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to look at addressing contradictions between electrification ambitions and decarbonization realities. And as Antoine mentioned, I would like to do this at a subnational level. So um, I work at the University of Oxford, um, as Antoine also mentioned, at the Centre for Research into Energy Demand Solutions. And we are particularly interested in what constitutes energy demand and how energy demand can be reduced and shifted, which is um, very closely linked to um, Marusha's points about void shift improve in the transport sector. But this looks uh, at um, reducing demand at an economy wide perspective. So what does this mean? So there's some organizations, for example, this is just one um, um, item that I picked from the internet. Uh, it is commonly assumed that energy demand is going to significantly increase. So for example, this is from Shell, a recent publication which suggests that um, the world will need more energy to power homes and fewer transport for a growing population with rising living standards. Uh, lower down, I've also marked a sentence which suggests that experts agree that global energy demand is likely to double by 2050 compared to demand in the year 2000. However, we would like to challenge these assumptions that um, there is inevitably going to be growing energy demand in the coming decades. So um, there's been some recent publications such as uh, this publication by Grubler um, on a, a low energy demand scenario for 2050. So on the right hand side, you can see various assumptions about where our energy demand would lie in 2050. So I've marked, so I've highlighted in red with a red bar in the middle, which is our current energy demand, which is 294 exajoule per year. And this assumption, for example, that was made by Shell suggests that we will more than double our energy demand. So that would be over 600 exajoules by 2050. Now, as um, Pascal and Marusha have suggested, it would probably be impossible to provide such an energy demand through clean energy sources and to electrify it. So various organizations have put forward different scenarios to suggest different ways that we could um, reach high living standards without increasing energy demand significantly. Here on the right hand side, we can see several um, scenarios. For example, the International Energy Agency has one which suggests an energy demand around 400 exajoule. But this particular scenario developed by Grubler et al. is the low energy demand scenario, which is at the bottom, which is the lowest one on the right hand side, which is around 250 um, exajoule per year. So um, at the bottom left, they also indicate how this reduction in energy demand could then actually le lead to a very significant increase in the share of renewable energy to supply this energy demand. So we can see a very significant increase in electricity powering this lower energy demand, whereas a higher energy demand scenario assumes a much lower share of electricity covering our, our, our overall energy demand, which very closely reflects the findings by Pascal. Now, what does this actually mean in practice? So in practice, this means that the development and the urbanization of cities following a pattern of Atlanta on the left hand side is undesirable, whereas, for example, following a pattern of Barcelona on the right hand side would be much more desirable. This follows on from um, Marusha's point early on that if we have compact cities, we can provide multimodal transport systems. And already, as we can see in the right hand side at the bottom, the transport car emissions in the city of Barcelona are about 1.0 tons per capita. 
Whereas in Atlanta on the left-hand side, we have per capita transport emissions of around 6.9 tonnes. And so we need to ensure that the mobility systems that we put forward can also ensure that, or, or rather, that they need to co-involve with urban planning to ensure that we don't lock in particular transport habits around automobility. And denser urban planning also enables people to live more closely to each other, which also enables buildings to be built in closer proximity to each other, which reduces the energy demand of living arrangements. So denser cities reduce the energy demand of transport as well as of heating buildings. Now, why is this relevant? So this is um, a table I've taken from the IPCC, so from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report from 2014. Uh, the newest one will be published um, early next year, which shows what the main driver of global carbon emissions has been. So the red um, bar, which is at the bottom between 1971 and 2000, but which is at the top and between 2001 in, and 2010, is actually the carbon intensity of energy. This actually shows that the carbon intensity of energy has actually been a driver of carbon emissions between 2001 and 2010, rather than a reducer of carbon emissions. Whereas the biggest relative driver of carbon emission reductions is the energy intensity of GDP. This reflects the first slide that Pascal showed from the Kaya identity, which shows that one of the key drivers of carbon emissions is, the, um, is energy divided by GDP. So it's energy demand reductions that to date have been the most important driver of carbon emission reductions. So at the same time, uh, the same report shows that energy demand reductions also overall have a greater overlap. So there's more synergies between energy demand reduction targets and the ability to reduce energy demand and the achievement of sustainable development goals, which is in the middle of this table. On the left-hand side, we have the trade-offs and the synergies between energy supply and the sustainable development goals, and the right-hand side between land use changes. And so we can see that focusing on energy demand, so energy demand reduction, especially in the rich world, rather than just focusing our carbon reduction ambitions on energy supply, has much more overlap with the sustainable development goals. So now for a concrete case study in the UK, um, this is some research which was done in the Centre for Research and Energy Demand Solutions. Um, we can see here, um, these are the decarbonisation figures in the UK between 1990 and 2020. Um, and in the bottom graph on the left hand side, we can see that end use energy efficiency, so energy demand reductions, have been the main driver for carbon emission reductions. Um, whereas, for example, there were some assumptions made about um, so uh, whereas um, renewable electricity, as we can see, is um, the fifth from the left, has only contributed, relatively speaking, with a single digit percentage to carbon emission reductions. So even though the UK is now leading in Europe in terms of its share of energy generated from renewable sources in recent years um, from wind power, its actually driver for carbon emission reductions has been reductions in energy demand rather than the supply of renewable electricity. The UK um, also has um, now stands at a crossroad in terms of the trajectory it would take in future to decarbonize its economy. Um, at our centre, at our research centre, we have recently modelled several scenarios which suggest that um, energy demand reduction could play the key role to achieving zero carbon by 2050. So among the most ambitious scenarios, uh, we have identified a pathway which could reduce the UK's energy demand by over 52% by 2050. Scenarios which suggest that the government will place more emphasis on the supply side suggest that energy demand might only reduce by 5%. 
as it currently stands, current policies are on the upper trajectory, which here is called the ignore trajectory, the only a 5% reduction of demand. This is where we currently stand. And it seems unlikely, or yeah, it seems nearly impossible that we will actually achieve our decarbonization targets without significant reductions in demand. Now, what does reduction in demand actually entail? This here is now, um, this is a table prepared by the UK's electricity grid operator, National Grid. And they have created several scenarios themselves. They've also created four scenarios, incidentally. And at the bottom left is the least ambitious scenario, which suggests the slowest credit of decarbonization and one where we will not reach net zero by 2050. Then we have the system transformation one, which is just to the right of that, which is very technology heavy, which assumes um, consumers less inclined to change behavior, which might just about reach net zero by 2050. Then the scenarios above the orange and the green ones. These are the, the, the scenarios that assume much greater engagement with people, and they foresee a much higher level of societal engagement in decarbonization and a much higher chance of actually achieving decarbonization. So what we're suggesting here is that by focusing on energy demand reductions, we're actually focusing on various actors at a sub-state level. So we're talking about local authorities, we're talking about communities, we're talking about individuals who can all contribute to climate change mitigation, not just technological pathways. Now, how can this be achieved? So in the UK, uh, we actually saw a diversification, for example, of energy suppliers between about 2004 and 2018, as you can see by this table. However, um, this was something which was pointed out um, in an earlier presentation by Samuel, that um, we're actually seeing a concentration of power in retail energy markets. So as you can see here towards the far right, this is a little um, addition that I added to um, this table provided by the Office for Gas and Electricity Markets in the UK. It shows that the number of suppliers in the UK has collapsed by about 50% in the last half year due to rising gas prices. So we're seeing a massive concentration of power in the supply market. So this means that sub-state actors well, to focus on the supply market appears at this moment in time not to be a good idea for substate actors. So the focus needs to shift to energy demand reductions to achieve zero carbon locally. So I'm just going to now move to three brief case studies to show what this actually implies. So Malmö in Sweden uh, is now considered one of the leading cities for um, regional decarbonization efforts. And um, also a proponent of the 20 um, minute neighborhoods that Marusha mentioned. Um, 20 years ago, it was a very heavily industrialized city, but then it embarked on a very ambitious decarbonization trajectory. And now it's considered at the forefront of developing low carbon neighborhoods. Um, and interestingly, it is one of these cities that has actually grasped the lack of strategic decision making power over energy supply as an opportunity to think about decarbonization much more strategically from a local planning perspective. So taking into account how, how neighborhoods are constituted and what makes them livable and how people move around and how jobs can be created locally. So the focus here is very much on where energy demand lies and how energy demand is constructed and how unfavorable forms of energy demand can be avoided and shifted towards favorable ways of using demand. For example, the avoid shift improve framework that Marusha mentioned. So this 20 year process now has enabled Malmö to embed sustainable development goals and also use the city as a test bed. So different neighborhoods, they have a slightly different focus here. So now I um, apologize my poor pronunciation, but um, Augustenborg um, is the test lab for climate adaptation, Hilje for smart local energy solutions, and Sega Park for its sharing economy. So they're trying different ways of tackling the climate issue 
in different neighborhoods. So this urban labs approach has enabled Malmö to create a very dynamic and innovative approach to addressing climate change locally. Colin? Yes? I, I don't want to cut you in your presentation, just to let you know that we will soon need to move forward. Uh, just to bring about, uh, bring up the you know African uh, example as well. So I, I I just have two more slides. Sure, let's go. I just um, so Bristol, I have to talk about Bristol because I'm in Bristol. Bristol has very ambitious decarbonisation targets. It aims to decarbonise by 2030, but it has zero strategic decision making power over its electricity supply. So hence, it is um, it now is looking to procure a delivery partner local to address the energy infrastructure, which is all about energy demand. So we're talking about heating systems, we're talking about district heating networks, we're talking about mobility systems and retrofitting the housing stock. And finally, um, the segue into the um, next presentation is um, Dakar and Senegal is a very good example of how a city in the global south is driving innovation. Um, interestingly, it's, it's going to host the first um, supposedly climate neutral car rally in the world, the Dakar rally, which aims to go climate neutral by 2030. Um, but the city now is, um, is uh, hosting one of the largest wind farms in Africa with 158 megawatts built close by. And in this case, um, we have to see that um, energy access is one of the key enablers for a sustainable climate future. So why the cities of the global north need to focus on energy demand and how energy demand is constructed. This is something which needs to coincide with a sustainable supply of electricity in the cities of the global south. Thank you very much for your attention. Colin, thank you so much for bringing up all these examples. And uh, this is a perfect bridge to the next uh, speaker, uh, who is Charlene Kwasi. Charlene, bonjour. Um, je suis ravi que tu sois avec nous. Et merci beaucoup, Colin. On, on aura le temps peut-être de prendre une ou deux questions. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I think we'll be able to have a few questions in the future. <clears throat> and I hope you will be able to uh, solve your microphone problems because it was very difficult to follow your speech. <clears throat> so, Charlene, we spoke about Dakar previously, <clears throat> and <clears throat> let's continue talking about uh, Africa. Um, <clears throat> we look at electrification uh, challenges. I think about the World Bank's publication in which so many sub-Saharan Africans don't even have access to electricity. So when you talk about electri electricity itself, um, we have to think about electricity as access also. So there's a very city-based uh, dynamic. Needs are going up, uh, especially uh, uh, for transportation. We also spoke about uh, living standards, especially in cita cities. Especially for the middle classes, which want and have a greater need for mobility. So, how is electrification to be included in this dynamic, especially concerning transportation in Africa? And how can you do this? Thank you for inviting me. It's always a pleasure to be here with you, indeed to understand this topic of the electrification mix from an, an African perspective, we need to keep in mind that there are discrepancies which are very strong and differences within the African continent. We talk about several Africas on the right hand side. The figure which you gave is, is right. We have about 47% of the populations we do not have access to electricity. So when we think about mobility, we don't always think about electrification. We think mainly of a standard energy, combustion, fossil energy, and so on. And what we've observed in this paradigm is always an opposition between the rural and the uh, urban areas with an access that is greater in urban areas and pop and 
countries whose populations are more rural have less access to electrification. One exception, however, was the Maghreb, with almost 100 percent of electrification in the Maghreb. So, with Morocco first, and then Algeria despite a part of the renewable energy, which is still small, around 6%, but the uh, CDNs, NDCs, revisions and review and current strategies show that the part of the uh, renewable energy is a bit greater in the electricity mix. What we see is that the electricity mix is underexploited in Africa despite great potential. There's a lot of potential in terms of hydroelectricity, dams and other projects that are being implemented on the continent, mainly with access to solar energy. Of course, that's pretty logical, especially when you come from the outside, people would obviously notice that we have great solar energy why do we not use it more? Again, there's a lack of infrastructure and a lack of planning. We're also facing a gap when I'm talking about the north, south, west and central east. I'm talking about the part of RE in the electricity mix, for example, in East Africa, Kenya, Rwanda, Rwanda and Uganda have a greater share of uh, RE, way over most of the Western countries, actually. They use a lot of wind power, hydrogen power, and the part of fossil energy is around 30%, which is pretty low compared to the rest of the continent. Whereas in the West, we are average 17%, 70% for fossil energy. This raises questions, environmental issues, of course, but also uh, issues of decarbonization, especially with the pressure on um, mine or oil uh, resources. Hence the need to have uh, standards for the import of cars. Maruxa was talking about this earlier on. As of today, Few countries in Africa have uh, these kinds of standards regarding the import of cars with an increasing demand in the, the West. The amount of, uh, of diesel or, or gas uh, cars uh, are to be found in Africa with the lack of standards that we have, it's gonna be very difficult to move through this transition. Now regarding transport, to go a bit more into our topic today, what we've observed is that the electricity mix has a different, takes a different place depending on the level of maturity and the level of governance of the system. For example, in countries with some regulations and a more involved governance, through uh, transport authorities, we do see uh, some coherent strategies with a long-term electrification of transport systems, like the diversification of the various sources of energy, depending on the territories or the locations in West Africa, for example, we don't necessarily exploit the same type of energy than in Central or Eastern Africa. In our modernizing policies of urban mobility systems, we see a multiplication of these policies and the share of RE is increasing with new projects such as the Metro and electrified line, for example, in uh, Abidjan, with new electrified lines in Nairobi, in Dakar, Addis Abeba, in some of these African cities which want to move forward um, 
regarding their transport system and transport policies, what we are seeing is that there is a willingness to electrify the transport system. And more generally, we are seeing also the development of other initiatives regarding electricity mobility, mainly through motor taxis, for example, in the east of Africa, but more generally overall in Africa. Also, uh, electric, electric bicycles and light vehicles with an example here on your right hand side of gas buses in Abidjan. It's the first company, transport company, that has made the choice of choosing um, bus, electric buses or gas, methane gas buses. That's really a way forward that shows that there are possibilities to move to uh, electricity mix and to shift to decarbonization. This is also an extract of the roadmap of Morocco. Climate Chance was partner in 2017 and they show a willingness, or the Kingdom of Morocco rather, is showing a willingness to shift to electrification of public transport and put this at the core of their policies, uh, whether it be with light vehicles, buses, and three-wheel vehicles. As a conclusion now, I'd like to focus on three types of stakeholders that can really help us move to the electricity mix First of all, the private sector. This is a reality that on the African continent, the private sector is really the driver of this shift in order to change a paradigm with the development of new innovations, new initiatives of electric mobility, despite sometimes a lack of support, yet we can find solutions, which you can see on the right-hand side, and other solutions and other groups are managing to come up with new solutions through taxis, motor taxis, electric motor taxis, etc. through a battery, a rechargeable battery system. There are many solutions, for example, in Kenya or in Rwanda, or in Kenya as well, Opibus in Kenya, the first uh, car and motor cars uh, manufacturers on the continent. This is designed in Sweden, but it is produced locally. And the engineering is from Kenya, which is a great way forward for the continent. These kind of initiatives need to be multiplied and they are raising awareness among governments to change mentalities and to lead to investments for decarbonization in the transport sector. A few states are committing to this, for example, the Republic of Kenya, Rwanda, uh, the Kingdom of Morocco. These countries are implementing public policy, South Africa as well, are implementing public policies through these programs. And finally, what we can see is that these commitments are also giving ways to a local commitments. Rwanda, Kenya, and Morocco signed the declaration to transition during COP26 towards zero emission. That's really a great progress. These commitments are also at the international level. And the civil society, of course, is also mobilizing. Other NGOs than Fabio, for example, in Uganda or others, they also uh, are activists. They do lobbying to mobilize and to raise awareness, just as the private sector does and to encourage a research and development with universities in order to develop 
electric solutions on the continent globally. I would say that there is great potential in Africa. There are solutions. I only mentioned a few. Many things are happening, which is really the political aspect and the standardization aspect and the financial aspect. These are the three aspects which sometimes are lacking in the continent. Yet I am still optimistic. There are some real changes to be done in the coming years. Thank you, Charlene. You are the president of the Observatory of African Mobility. Thank you for your presentation. I think it was important to end this discussion uh, talking about local stakeholders. One of the key takeaway of this annual report and our discussions throughout this morning was actually to talk about the emerging of a concentration of powers. As Colin was saying, with the UK, with energy suppliers, and we see this also with electricity suppliers, with Tesla, for example, Tesla, Tesla with the new strategies for concentration in order to secure their supplies in terms of raw materials. The main stakeholders are better equipped to manage transition locally in Africa. In cases that you have presented, there are also local stakeholders who are able to develop uh, sectors and supply chains which are regionalized. Thank you, Charlene, for your presentation. I want to apologize for all the people who who had questions or wanted to make comments. We talked about Dakar. I know we have a lot of our listeners from Dakar today. Also to remind you that we do have a section on Dakar in our report, uh, talking about the TER and the BRT. And also I want to thank all of, our, of the co-writers, people, the team from the observatory all the experts who have helped us in this. Um, the report is now available online. Thank you very much, Colleen, Charlene, Pascal, and Maruxa for joining us this morning. We really enjoyed all your presentations and all the debates and the discussion that we had throughout this week. And as of this afternoon, you can join other workshops. This afternoon, there will be a workshop regarding supply chains and the place and the role of large companies. We will continue our debate this afternoon. Are our large companies in a better position to accelerate transition? We will also be talking about uh, other transition initiatives tomorrow morning at 11. We'll be talking about new technologies, uh, hydrogens, and so on. And tomorrow afternoon at 2 p.m., we'll be talking about territorialization. We'll be talking about forest, building sector, transport sector, and see how local governments are able to move forward in the transition. Thank you for joining us. We will see you this afternoon or tomorrow morning. Enjoy your break now, and I encourage you once again to read the report. Thank you very much. Goodbye.